turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Something that I've been thinking about quite a bit lately is the idea of <clears throat> having the habit of keeping promises of God in, in your thoughts, in your prayers, just in your day-to-day, -day, how it is that you think. And I know I've talked a lot about how you're constantly confronted with lies when, you know, this is a fallen world and, and a lot of it is, is just permeated in every aspect with deception. And we know Jesus was explaining that Satan is the father of lies. And when he, when he uses lies, the intent is to construct something to facilitate destruction. That's the idea that, you know, Jesus came to restore. He came to give us life. And Satan is here for the opposite of that. And so we can't do anything about the lies confronting us constantly, uh, but we can do things about how to, how to handle them. And a big part of that is, I know David's talked about this quite a bit, that you, it's not so much that you focus on being able to recognize the lies as it is that you focus on knowing what the truth is then the lies are evident. I think that was last week when the uh, pastor was talking about the, the uh, vision. It was a dream or vision that he was, a vision where he saw that, you know, these huge constructs of, of deception are, you can see through them if you look carefully. And, you know, they're, they're easy to take apart if you just use the truth, you know, if you just look at it honestly. But uh, that's not always simple, but here in Ephesians chapter 3, notice what Paul says here in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that, you may, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Paul prays for this because it's not an easy thing to receive. It's something that you have to pursue very much, uh, you know, constantly. And, I mean, we're, we're, you know, people that are, that are of flesh, but also carry the Spirit. So there's going to be a struggle there for, to, to receive, you know, things like how to know what the love of Christ is, like the love of God that he has for you, how it is that you can measure it, and then know it and believe it and receive it. Those are all uh, lofty goals. But in order for us to be mature and to be what God intends us to be, to, to grow into what he has planted, it must be that way. And Well, he says in verse 20, notice, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. You know, there was a thing that Jesus said that, you know, you, until now you've asked for nothing in my name. But ask. Ask in my name and the Father will hear you and he will do it because you ask in my name. So not only are we clear of that, but we know that God actually does better than what we can even think to ask for. But he still wants us to ask. Because, you know, in that you are, you're proclaiming the Lord's promise back to him oftentimes. And that's a powerful thing. You know, I, I don't know, I imagine most people here have prayed the scriptures to the Lord. That's a, that is a, that's a really good habit to have. I think it's in maybe Psalm 
140, 142, somewhere around there where David is saying, you know, I, I, I cry out with my complaint to you. I just bear it all out and, you know, not, not intending to edit or, or to, to hide what's, what I'm seeing going on. I think a lot of times about how in um, Romans, for instance, Paul was explaining that he's aware of the conflict, even though he has the Holy Spirit and he's pursuing the Lord fervently and wants to be found in his favor. And that is his, his overwhelming drive and goal. But he still is clear that there's a, there's a conflict, that there's a part of him that doesn't want that. And he even said it makes him a prisoner. But, you know, for us to walk freely, we have to, you've got to have yourself permeated with the truth of what God has promised. So he's able to do above all that we ask or think according to his power that works within us. Notice chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a, man- in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. You know, the humility is a, a crucial aspect of that. I remember I was reading through James and I was kind of struck with how many times he mentioned that. You have to be humble. And, you, you know, we know humility is seeing things as it is rightly. It is, um, well, that's the only way that you can receive the grace of God. The great confounding grace of God is with humility. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. You remember what John the Baptist said, that the Lord doesn't give the Spirit by measure, that you know, you can be as close to God as you want to be. You can receive of the Spirit as much as you want. And it's because Jesus overcame the grave, that he, he was raised from the grave, and it, it is in this that we can hold fast to his promises because he stands alone in that manner. He alone, the firstborn of many brethren, Verse 9, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who has descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he, you know, he, he explains the gifts that God has put in the offices. And, you know, we understand that these things are, uh, they're blessings, but they're also responsibilities. They're also a weight to carry. It's a burden that you have to bear. And the idea is so that the, the body can be made effective. It says in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body in Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects to him who is the head, even Christ. You know, the waves will come. The storms will come. That's guaranteed. The idea is that those that are following the truth are put together in a way that they're not moved by those storms, they're not moved by those waves, that they can actually break them. It's the parable that Jesus was given about the house being built. You know, you can build it on something that's not stable, something that isn't true, 
or you can build it upon something that is. It's much harder to do that. It's very easy to build upon things that aren't true. It's, it's very difficult. You know, the speaking the truth in love is one of the hardest things in the world to do. I mean, we all know that. That's one of the reasons that we lie, because it's much easier. It's much easier to lie. Telling the truth is hard most of the time. That's why, you know, it's very seldom that people do it. But what Paul is saying here is that you can do that, and you can do it in love, and it will be difficult, but it's, it's the only thing of value. Because without the truth, none, none of the, there's nothing that matters without the truth. It's not sustainable. So we're to grow up in all aspects to him, the stature of Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself and love. You know, that's the, I think there's always been an attraction for people to advocate their responsibility for themselves to someone else. And that's, you know, you see that oftentimes with uh, church leaders. Um, The Pope is a good example of that where people aren't concerned so much with finding out what their faith is about, but, but instead just following what an individual is telling them. And, you know, Paul walked that balance where he's saying it's like you, you make use of those that are your leaders and those that have been blessed with the gift of teaching or, or, or pastoring or, you know, any of those things that he mentioned here in chapter 4, but you test yourselves and you prove yourselves and you, you know, you don't, you, you be like the Bereans where you're, you're, you're looking into what you're being taught and you're taking responsibility for your faith and your, you know, uh, your connection to the Lord personally. You can't borrow that from someone else. And, you know, it starts with the individual. And then the proper working of each individual causes the growth of the body. It's not the other way around. It's, it starts with you. And you get, you know, that, that lockstep with the Lord that is able to create a connection with your brethren that is meaningful and can cause growth rather than hindrance. Let's turn over to James just for a moment. Something that James said in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 2, James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. I mean, that's how it works. Your faith is tested. It's not pleasant, but it produces endurance. And then when you have endurance, then you're more capable. You can have a greater impact in a a positive way. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's a promise. That's You can... You can put faith in that. And the same way we know when we come before him, I think Sandy prayed this last night, that we're sprinkled with his blood. We know that. We know that when we come before him, it's, it's, we're not coming on our own accord, but that we have blood that speaks on our behalf. That way we can have confidence. And we can approach him in the right way. So likewise, with this instruction here if you're lacking wisdom you ask of god and you don't do it blindly you know you know what it is that you're asking for because everything has a cost and that you know the the wiser you are the tougher you must become the heavier weight that you will carry but there's the greater reward notice how james gives the clarification here he says in verse six but let him ask in faith without doubting For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. 
For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. So, you know, you have to, you have to approach it in the right way. You, I think about what Jesus was telling us there in Matthew chapter 7 where he was explaining how it is that you're to see your heavenly father. And he, he gave the, the example of a, of a father and his son, an earthly father and his son, you know, and he said if, if he asks him for a fish, he's not going to give him a snake, will he? If he asks him for bread, he's not going to give him a stone. It's like if you, you can understand that. That's clear to you. So, so much more so your heavenly father, you can know that when you ask for something that is good and that is according to his will, he will give it to you. And anything that he withholds from you, is just, it means that it wouldn't be good for you at that time. It just depends on, you know, the maturity that you have and the, and the, the faith that you have cultivated. And in 1 John chapter 5, Notice verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is the truth. You know, there's that. Another promise that we have is wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You know, that there's, there's a freedom that's found in the presence of God. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood. These three are in agreement. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that he is born witness concerning his Son. You know, every promise that Jesus made, every promise that, that we have in the Word is backed up by that sacrifice. And not only that sacrifice, but the fact that he was raised from the dead. And that's, you know, Paul even said, that's how it is that we know we have our justification because Jesus was raised from the dead. So if you can believe a person and their promise, how much more so the Lord? Verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The one who does not believe has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has, has borne concerning his son. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Now notice verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So that's number one. He hears you. When you come before him humbly, he hears you. And it's our confidence that we have, that we know that. You know, there's the statement that Jesus make, made when he prayed out loud, and he said, Father, I thank you that you hear me, and I know you hear me always. But it was for the benefit of those that are standing here that I said that, so that they may believe. This is just the same thing. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which, he, which we have asked from him. So you can receive the love of God, you can believe it, you can walk in it, and you can be somebody who knows who they are and why they're here and that their Heavenly Father uh, accomplishes all that concerns them. He 
you know, as many as the promises of God, there are, there yes and amen. It is, it's by that, it's like um, drawing from a well daily. You know, you, you, you must do that in order to be that individual that's able to supply what the body needs. 